All right, well, we can go ahead and get started. Um, and uh, as usual, when I do presentations, I always ask, is there anything you're expecting to get out of this time? Tell me now so I can make sure to give it to you. Any questions that you want to make sure I address? I think, I, I think I'll probably get most of what you're wondering about, but we'll have Q&A at the end as well. Um, we've been doing a series of uh, Sunday forums Sunday, sometimes Sunday forms are one-off, sometimes they're a series. Next Sunday, we do start with John Hushin's series, series so he will uh, be here, be wonderful uh, learning uh, from him. Um, one of the things I do ask in all of the presentations I do is you always need to know about the author or who is presenting to you, their background, their prejudices and biases. So for today, you should know that I grew up in New Orleans, if you don't already know that. And I was trying to count the number of hurricanes I've been through, the number of times I've been evacuated, and all of the stories that we've had as a family. Um, and it was just the Gleasons at one point, but then I got married to another New Orleanian, and then I had all the Johnson stories too. Um, so, uh, you know, I have stories in my family going back to Camille, which hit the Mississippi Gulf Coast, past Christian, which is about an hour and a half uh, east of New Orleans. A lot of New Orleanians go there for the beach. And I had a great aunt who survived the storm, but only because she could get back up on top of her refrigerator to ride out the storm, right? That's when forecasting was a little bit different back then. You didn't quite know where those hurricanes would go. In comes Nash Roberts, who was the most wonderful weatherman ever. He was a weatherman during World War II, and everybody trusted him. They knew so much so that corporate finally took him off the air, because he would say, New Orleans, you don't have to worry about this. And you can't say that as a weatherman anymore. I mean, this goes back to uh, New or uh, Virginia's experiences with Katrina. Um, her grandparents' house was through. Her parents lost uh, their house. My sister lost her house. Um, and then we, uh, many of us all shared the story of Ian together uh, when that hit and floodwaters came. And now we get to share the story of Helene and Milton. So uh, we'll do that, but those are my biases. So know that hurricanes have been around uh, me for a, a long time. Maybe I'm bad luck, I don't know. <laughs> Think about that. <laughs> That's right. Let's start with prayer though. The Lord be with you. Amen. Almighty and everlasting God, we gather in a time of trial to ask your blessings on all of our endeavors. We offer our thanksgivings for the blessings in our lives and in the life of our parish family for those who rise to the occasion in times of need. We give thanks for first responders, dedicated volunteers, and all who offer their hands and hearts in the midst of disaster. Grant us strength in our work ahead, courage to face challenges, and peace in our hearts. We offer these prayers through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Well, let's see what's going on here. No, no, no. That was it. I already asked this question. I was going to say, before we begin, what questions do you have? But we'll hit that at the end. A brief history of Melton. Um, you all have experienced this. Um, I just want to offer the experience of the church, maybe my experience and the experience of the staff. Um, so uh, what was it? Last Sunday and a little bit before, we started seeing this storm uh, come together. Uh, we began watching the news and we began preparing. Um, and that's when the email went out uh, from me asking people to come in and help on Sunday move things up. Um, and that um, ask was responded to. Many young families, uh, many other people. And also one of the uh, new pieces in our life together is you know, this Port Royal neighborhood. We're a part of it. Um, and uh, the Port Royal Club as well, has been, uh, we've been giving them our space to meet in their time of need. And so they sent a whole team of people um, to help us on Sunday put sandbags out and raise furniture. Um, and they helped again, I think it was yesterday, the days are a little bit blurring, and they'll be here again tomorrow to help us move furniture. So, you know, it's just a reminder in, in times of trial, people do get together. Um, and it's a fitting end to the series I had about disagreeing. Uh, when we all have shared experience of trial, guess what? We don't ask what political party you are. We don't ask if where you're on, whatever social issue it is. We just all get together and help. So last Sunday, uh, raising all the furniture, and uh, you know, I think if you saw me, I was saying, prepare for water this high. Um, we did, which was great. Um, 
And then on Monday, the parish staff came together and sort of finished all those preparations that, you know, it's a, a little bit too hard to have volunteers help with. So the staff put all their furniture up on their desks. Uh, Chris was walking around shutting hurricane shutters. And um, you all have heard us preach about the body of Christ, and, and you all sort of know this theme that uh, we are one church, many members, each with our own talents, each with our own gifts, each with our own sort of role in how the church moves and works. So uh, that goes uh, for me, sitting out emails and praying and, you know, doing Sunday bulletins and Kim calling contractors and preparing and Chris humping stuff around and making sure we didn't miss anything. All of the church staff worked really well as a team um, and we should give thanks to them and we will by clapping for them right now. Um, and then Tuesday, uh, we really had everything battened down and this was a difference than Ian. Ian was sort of unexpected for us um, and so we didn't have as much time to figure things out. Um, but we did, uh, we did this year. So Tuesday we waited, Wednesday was the storm. Um, uh, I, I was at the rectory, um, I did get a little spooked. So we had, in any hurricane you should always have your plan. And then people will criticize your plan and that's fine. <laughs> um, don't criticize too much. Remember all those hurricanes I've been through, right? So you have your plan, you follow your plan, um, and you listen to the government authorities um, <laughs> And I found their response pretty fascinating. And we can talk about that over a cup of coffee sometime, not here, especially not when I'm being recorded. Um, but you know, I think what I did see from everybody, from all the government officials, is they had a care and concern, and they wanted everybody to be safe. Um, and that's the big thing to keep in mind. Government people aren't here just to inconvenience us. They really do want to keep the whole population as safe as possible. And I think that um, you know the city, this area in particular, it's a little bit mixed. You have some of the older houses that really are low, um, and you saw their furniture coming to church. Um, and then you have the rectory that's a finished floor of 11 and a half feet, higher even than the parish hall. Um, believe it or not, the regs in this area have changed. Uh, 2002, you had to be 11 and a half feet uh, up. Now you only have to be 11. So apparently, the powers that be think we're going lower instead of higher. Um, Let's compare. So these are pictures. Um, on the left, Virginia, forgive me, that was the water height at Ian. So um, you can see it's up to about Virginia's waist. Um, I can't, I don't have the picture of the window in there. The next one in the middle, that's the seawall right down here. That's the height of Helene. So um, three inches from even just coming up above. It was, got a little bit higher than that. And then the final picture is, uh, I keep wanting to say Mitchell, but it's Milton. Milton was 20 inches. So um, that's around the whole building, right? So 20 inches of water around the whole building. Had we not prepared, we would have seen about that amount inside of our buildings, the lower ones at least. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the whole church campus, we have the church offices, our oldest building, um, lower. You have to walk down to get to the office, about four and a half feet. Um, you have the Sunday school classrooms, youth room, church mouse, all over on that side. Again, lower level elevation. And then you have the church, lower level elevation. Um, all of those areas were um, taped, sandbagged. The flood panels were up um, for all of the Sunday school classrooms. And yet still inside the church, we got about two inches about the same in all the others. Now this looks like, a, this looks like so little. <laughs> it's not, because <laughs> it gets all of your walls wet and it gets into your floors. So um, that's sort of the impact we saw right off the bat. And Thursday comes. Um, so um, 5 a.m. I was out there taking pictures and documenting and looking and seeing. Always important to open up doors to get any water out that's still in there um, and then start remediating and drying out those buildings as quickly as possible. Uh, we had uh, two, three intrepid volunteers come down about 8 a.m. Um, and they were sweeping all of that out. Virginia was there. Um, the kids, we let them sleep in until 10. And then they came over and 
I wanted to lift up some of the furnishings in the Sunday school classrooms a little bit higher to get them off the wet floor so they could dry out a little bit more. Um, so we did that, and then about one o'clock, um, Virginia and I were exhausted. I think the volunteers were too, who were there. I mean, for me, it's a mixture of physical exhaustion, but also just, oh my gosh, really? We have to do this again? It's sort of a mental thing. Um, and you all, uh, Chris and Kim, have been watching me. They look at me, They're ready for me to have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> I'm okay, kind of. Um, so uh, then one o'clock came, and that's when the staff was all called in. Kim was there um, calling everybody, serving as the air traffic controller. She got everybody together. I did a walk around with Chris and Kim, and I said, I got to go take a nap. So um, I went uh, home with Virginia and the kids, and um, the staff continued all of the cleanup efforts. Um, so Kim, Chris, Bob, and Marcella, Joanne, Tripp, uh, Nicholas, they were all here working. And I think there were some other, the senior ward, the wardens both came down. Uh, Debbie and um, Connie both were here. Um, so they, they all sort of did what we could that day. And then it was also not just schlepping stuff around and moving water, it was also preparing ahead. So Kim was calling all of our contractors. Chris was uh, calling our contractors to get them all in. Um, and also um, calling in uh, specialized folks on our property committee. Uh, that's Mark Borelli, who does construction here in town, and John Ike, who was chair of the building committee for this hall, and then he was chair of the restoration committee for Ian. So um, they came in, and then Helene McGill um, started working um, on, she's our treasurer, started working on uh, reports for me and thinking about things. Um, that's when we also I went ahead and submitted our insurance claim. I think I'll talk about that a little bit later. That was just Thursday. Friday, um, the contractors arrive. Uh, we have the HA, HVAC, all the air conditioning units surveyed and fixed. Some of them were broken. Uh, the one over by Nicholas's office that conditions my air in my office, uh, the, the guy said, I've never seen anything like this. There were shells all in it. Uh, there's shells around, yeah. Um, the roofers came out and started surveying the roofs. We did have a leak over in the church, which was a bummer. Um, and then the sort of decisions start having to ma be made. What are we going to do? Um, how are we going to do it? Um, and um, you all know me. This is about the author again, right? We talked about hurricane damage. You also know that my middle name is Campbell, so I have some Scottish in me, so I really don't like spending money um, on stuff that isn't mission-oriented, right? Um, although the buildings are mission-oriented, we were going to have that as part of our stewardship talk today, <laughs> the importance of our buildings and, and why you're going to give to annual fund 2025. Um, but uh, that's where Mark Borelli and John are great because we work together and they can look at me and say, Edward, I know you don't want to spend money pulling up the floors, but guess what? We're going to pull up the floors. So uh, baseboards, and, and all of this is done in a, a, a thoughtful way. So let's take off the baseboard force first, see what's there. Uh, let's cut through the drywall in spots, see what's there. Let's take up a floor here or there and see what's there and then make the bigger decision, the more expensive fix. Um, so where we are right now is um, the baseboards and drywall about this high uh, in the churches and throughout the Sunday school classrooms, most of the church mouse, youth room, nursery will all be taken up. One of the things that I wish we had done last time in Ian that we didn't is you can get the uh, concrete board instead of the drywall. So if you all have done bathroom renovations, you know behind a shower you put the concrete wall. So I should have done that for everything, but we didn't. Um, and that was in a time when you know uh, it was harder to get stuff. So anyway, we're going to do that this time. So for about this much, we'll have that concrete floor. Um, one of the things that we did in the church, which I actually was unhappy about, during Ian, but I relented, was in, in the church, you really want all of God's creation. So you want real things. You don't want plastic. So that's why we don't have plastic flowers on Sunday, right? Well, we did put in PVC baseboards, so plastic baseboards in the church, and that's great because guess what? We don't have to replace those. Um, those will make it just fine. 
um, the offices were a little bit less affected. So um, one of the amazing things in Ian was the water in that was about, th well, this high. Um, again, we didn't have as much time to prepare, so we hadn't moved as many furnishings out. Um, this time, I don't even see how the water got in. Um, but in uh, some of the center offices, uh, you had a pooling of water that sort of went through the walls. Now that area is the oldest of the uh, church offices, the whole area. I think you could put a marble on the floor and it would sort of go around like this. <laughs> um, but uh, you saw so a little bit of an inconvenience in the offices, but not much. And that is a vast improvement from Ian. Ian, I was working from home. All the clergy were working from home. Carrie was in that closet. Um, it was a disaster. This go round will be sort of up and running maybe most of this week. We'll see. Right, Kim? <laughs> I, my office is fine. I'll be working. I'll be, I'll be fine. I, I haven't even showed you what showed up yesterday in my office. Yeah. Um, but sort of, um, but I, I, I think what's really good is the uh, clergy and office staff are, um, will, be, will be running at 80% or more, which is great. That means everything can sort of keep on keeping on. Um, on Saturday, uh, decisions continue to be made, um, and one of them is, you know, how to really speed up the restoration. Um, so we went ahead, uh, Kim said, do we bring pods on site or do we uh, do off site um, storage for the furnishings? Uh, we decided to do off site. It was, uh, I don't know if it's more cost effective. I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was. Um, <laughs> but the other, the other, you know, concern was if we put uh, things in pods outside, another storm comes, they're all lost, right? And I think, are those storage units conditioned or, and it, they're conditioned as well. So they'll be uh, not sitting out in the heat, um, which I think again will help save our contents. Um, I spoke uh, Ian versus uh, Milton. Ian, less damage overall. All of our furnishings are pretty much fine. The offices are fine. So that is all very positive and will make our comeback um, faster. Um, safer from storms, controlled air. So that's a call, right? Uh, if you're around tomorrow at 8 a.m., Come on down and help us move, uh, move stuff. We're going to do it in a methodical way. So if you do come and help, don't just come and put something and throw it in a pot. You have to listen to where we put it. We're going to stage it. It's like a whole Army Corps of Engineer, not Army Corps of Engineer. It's like a CB exercise. CBs are good. CBs, CBs get it done. Um, cost protections. So uh, hurricane costs money. We know this. Um, Ian costs $1.2 million. Um, and that was not including the organ. Again, this storm, our furnishings are okay, our offices are okay. I went ahead and submitted a claim with church insurance. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, you, you can get all sorts, you all have shopped for insurance for your homes. For the Episcopal Church, there's sort of, I don't, I don't know if you can call it a captive company, but there's a church insurance of Vermont sort of insures all of the Episcopal churches or most of them because we can't get coverage that is better than church insurance, and one of those is in flood. So uh, flood, it's a $1 million um, um, policy. Um, so that's really helpful in this time. Now, one of the things that uh, most Episcopal churches struggle with is meeting the deductible, which is a percentage of the value of the buildings. Um, years ago, we had a major gifts booklet um, and in that was the option to endow the hurricane deductible. Um, back then, I was a younger man, and I brought with me uh, Robbie Roberts and John Ike to a lunch which, with Richard Briscoe, and we ended that lunch with an endowed hurricane deductible. So the Carroll and Richard Briscoe Fund um, builds up in our endowment until it reaches that, uh, that deductible level. Um, and then following that, um, proceeds from that fund can be used for disaster preparedness. Um, and we'd done well, so we ha our fund was high, actually. So over the summer, we put in hurricane windows at the rectory, which saved in our prep time, what do you think, Chris, about three or four hours. So you know, as we're, we're frantically getting ready for storm, anything we can do to re reduce that sort of preparedness time 
is, is very valuable. So uh, both of our backs were happy about that. Um, and then we did go up to Nicholas's house in Autumn Woods, that's the parsonage. Uh, we put up the storm panels uh, there. Unfortunately, we had some great volunteers, so I sta stayed here and got ready for emails and other things, and uh, other folks went and did that. Um, so we'll sort of see how the cost projections and how the costs come in. Um, my guess is that we'll be over our deductible, so we'll actually pull in a claim, um, maybe 900000 that'd be my guess. Um, but I'm hoping, that's, that's to make me sleep better at night, right? Um, thinking about the next 75 years. So just as um, we were thoughtful about hurricane deductibles, uh, we were thoughtful when we built this parish hall, higher. Um, I've been thinking, along with others in the Finance Commission, the Vestry, the Property Commission, what does it look like for this church in the next 75 years? Our strategic plan has the offices going away and being built up on a higher level, two stories, with a multi-purpose area underneath that would be probably church mouse, uh, and then all of the offices up above. Um, I thought I was going to get away with not having to do that at all. We'll see. I mean, that's like an eight-year, ten-year time frame to probably put that together. Um, we did get, uh, on the children's atria side, I did start the ball rolling after Ian to get our architects looking at what can we do that might be cheap. Because of the pilings that are underneath that, not really, so they say, not cost effective to cut those and raise the whole thing. But in those rooms, and it's, this is a lot like the conference room, the library, the family room, uh, the choir room, there's enough space in the ceiling to raise the ceiling and then raise the floor. Um, and that would be tremendous. And not, not too expensive, don't know. Um, but that will be uh, you know, very much in thinking about the nearer term. Um, what that does to the church mouse in that area is a little bit confused. They need to come up with a plan for us to look at. Um, and, and the other thing that was done in this back in 2002, when the rectory was right next door to um, the parish hall, um, that was moved and raised up and put at current code levels. So we have been working as a parish family to address the idea of going up uh, for many, many years. Um, what about the church, right? So um, I've had uh, wonderful people say, can we raise it? What can we do? How should we do this? I have asked those questions of the contractors and, and different people and thought about what it might look like. Um, this go round, two storms in two years, I'm going to put together a group of people, a commission, uh, to really look through and study all of these issues in a way that's not just, hey, architect, tell me what we can do. We're going to dig a little deeper um, and think about all of the different options uh, we might have. And that's where in that commission everything will be on the table. I don't know what that means. Um, but then we'll look at it and see um, what, is, what is a good and holy way to deal with the problem of these storms. Um, and that's where, you know, the, the commission will be people who know about um, regulations for building codes, who have worked through mitigation with condominiums on the uh, beachfront. Um, people who have had an experience with um, the church and its buildings, the parish hall project, the hurricane restoration. Um, and then, you know, some of those old time Trinitarians who have a vested generational issue, uh, not issue, interest in the church, right? So, and, and then we'll just think, and I don't know what will come of that, um, but it will have at least done the work because um, we don't want to stick our heads in the sand, right? We look up, we address challenges as they come, and we think through them. Questions or comments? Look, how did I do on time? Pretty good. 14 more minutes for questions. Wow. Linda Benny. How is the organ fair this time? Organ fair. So right now we have a temporary organ, right? Um, Tripp calls it a toaster. So, uh, <laughs> toaster. So it was funny, uh, we got the, there's a speak, big speaker, there's speakers up behind the pipes. Those were going to be fine, right? 
But then there's a speaker on the ground, and I looked at that and I said, we got to move that. So I unplugged the speaker. Hopefully we can get it plugged in right again. Uh, and then uh, Chris got the dolly, and it came up. It's right here. Now it's in my office, I think. And then there was the toaster itself, which is the organ console. Trip was, uh, Trip was out of town. He was just coming back. By the way, Trip isn't allowed to leave in the month of October anymore. Every time he's got, he went off for a recital with the Boston Symphony, and you know, he, he went off for a wedding, and so no more, Trip, because the storm comes. Um, so it was uh, Chris and I, we walked over, and we said, we got to get the footboard off first. So we pulled the footboard off. That came off without a without a hitch. I hope it's okay. Uh, we put that up high, and then I said, we really got to get this thing up, you know, let's get it up four bricks high. We ended up getting it two bricks high. Um, it was heavy as lead, and it's a tight space, but again, the, one of the things that we uh, realized is uh, we got to get things, no matter where they are, up a little higher, um, and that was what we learned in Ian, and before then, we didn't have a storm that had affected us until Donna, going back to the 60s. So all of our experience that we've learned now, we're sort of documenting. Um, so hopefully we respond better in the future. Did I answer? So the organ, the organ is fine. The pews are fine. Um, they, there is this neat gun. They come around with this gun. It looks like a radar gun. And they point it at all the baseboards and it measures where the, uh, where the water is in the wall. It was not my friend. I was hoping for a different result. As they shot each thing, I was like, please, no whammies, um, as the game show goes. Um, so they did do the pews, and they looked to be OK. And, and those are hard wood. I mean, they, they aren't drywall. Um, what they're going to do, and this is where every time they said this, I didn't roll my eyes. I did roll my eyes. But bacteria. So they're all worried about bacteria from the uh, bay coming on in. Um, and the, the remediation team, we have their license, so they have to follow all the regs, no matter if Louisiana boy thinks they're a little bit, a little bit too much. Um, so uh, the pews will be wiped down on the bottoms for bacteria, um, will ozone things. I mean, there's a whole procedure. That's why I think it's going to be more expensive than just, oh, it's just a little drywall, and we'll see. What other questions? Yes. Yes, it actually was. So uh, very much on our minds when we went about the uh, thinking about a new organ for the church, um, a couple of different pieces. One was a case to prevent any water coming in from above, from the roof. The other was uh, addressing the HVAC system. There's a big condenser, air handler, uh, right above where the current organ is, and that has caused damage. Um, so we're moving that out and putting in a split system, um, which will get any kind of AC worry away from the pipes and wind chests. The final one that uh, the architect, the builder, and the organ builder are still, uh, I've, I've, I've mandated that they do it, which is a lift system for the organ console. And they're all sort of scratching their head. And I said, I've seen it happen in like organ, I mean, in, in, in concert halls. Surely you can get me a lift. So they're still working on that. Um, but that's where, so you would figure the console has a lift. The pipes are as protected as possible. Um, so yes, we have taken the, all of that into consideration. If you have any other brighter ideas, I'm all ears. There was another, let's go, Judy. The Bruton Parish Church, which this is, of course, modeled after, has a six to eight foot wall around it, which is a very lovely wall. It has a very nice shaped top on it. You might consider that around, appropriately around the property, and then sealing the entrances where people come and go with having a ceiling, a gate that comes up, or something like that. But you're basically diking the building. Ex Exactly right. We were walking around yesterday looking, that, looking at that, in fact, and wondering what would the city let us do with regard to setbacks and everything else. Um, 
Every time I've tried to do a project here that makes this church less vulnerable, it's ended up with FEMA and other people giving us headaches like you'd never believed. Well, you might have trouble with the outbuildings, but it's mm -hmm. protect the outbuildings, which yeah. is for outbuildings. No, that's it. If you have enough room around the church, even with whatever setbacks, they would ask you to put in, to put up, it's an attractive building. Yeah. You're exactly right. Yeah. Yeah. You're exactly right. And it, build, it builds on the architectural view of the church already with those walls that do go to the outbuilding. So as we were walking around yesterday with Mark Borelli and John Ike, that's exactly one of the things we were talking about and how to do it best. Um, and then there are newer products that are out there um, that we'll be looking at. Everybody uh, who was watching the news has said to me, Tampa, Tampa, the hospital. Can you get the stuff that the hospital had? And we'll, we'll look at that. There's another spot I was walking uh, downtown to, and I walked past Badass Coffee. Um, and uh, I was talking to their owners and they had, um, Damn easy, damn easy came out to help them and it worked. Um, so damn easy will come out and uh, look at our uh, doors as well. We don't know if that'll work, but all of that's on the table. Yeah. Closer. Yeah. So uh, yeah, all of that. And then there was another one that involved uh, putting water in, and I was like, how do we get that much water? Yeah. So uh, all those we're looking at, and we'll be uh, figuring that out for the next one. Yes, Linda, two questions. Before I, I take on Linda, anyone else before Linda? She's got one already. One over here from Joyce, and then we'll go back to Linda. Got to be fair. Um, well, what do you think? I don't know. I mean, it just occurred to me earlier, after one of the earlier storms, and I have no idea. I mean, I, certainly ashes to ashes, it's soil. But yeah, so theologically, I can't think of any reason why you would want to do anything. Um, but, you know, when, and this gets into, I'm sorry if this makes you all uncomfortable, um, if evil has been, um, you know, present in a place, so a murder, um, some sort of devil worship, you do go back in and you do sort of an exorcism. Um, I can't say that a storm is inherently evil. Um, it may have things that we don't like. Um, so that's the sort of theological sense, but then there's the pastoral sense, right? So our loved ones are there. Uh, we want to know that it is holy ground. And I will say it is holy, not just because priests have walked around praying and asking God's blessing on it, but because people have been reposed there. And that act of placing someone's, in, someone's ashes into the ground does not change. It makes the place even more holier. So uh, my sense would be, you know, it's just fine. And in the next person, you know, we put into the ground there, again, all those prayers will be said in those places. And that's where when I was saying a church is a place that is saturated in prayer, that's what those places are. And stormwater doesn't change that to me. But if any of you all have loved ones in the ground there and you want me to come and say a prayer with you in that moment, in that space, absolutely, right? Sort of an Episcopal wishy-washy answer, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> Linda. The church mouse is, um, did sustain damage. Um, can I make a decision about this, Kim? Or are we still listening to folks? The sale next week. Cancel. So the sale next week is canceled. We have to empty the church We have to empty um, you know, think about, think about the church and all of its ministry in these terms, which is the Sunday school classroom, the church mouse, and the church, for now are all construction sites. Um, and so we really want to give the contractors all of the space that they can to do those things, as well as make sure that anyone walking around is safe. Their tripping hazards, their nails, their all sorts of stuff. So when it comes to uh, uh, things that are happening in the parish hall, 
uh, or in the uh, church offices or so luncheons, um, worship, all that will be here. Small group meetings, that's all fine. What else? Yes, Ed. Oh, we always ask timeline. Uh, when, when, the, when, the parent, when this building was built, uh, I kept saying, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. He was, I think they were thinking January, February. Um, no, I guess that was the, well, I can't remember which that was. Um, that was Ian. So uh, we got in at Thanksgiving, before Thanksgiving. Uh, this one, uh, we asked worst case scenario, three months for the Sunday school classrooms. Um, I would think we'll get church done sooner. Um, we push them. We push them. Janet? That was, question. that was your question. That's yes? The reason, that's the reason to empty everything out of those rooms. Rather, we, we debated, do we just move stuff from one room to one room if you're doing it? And they said, if you empty them, we will go a lot faster. Yeah. Kim's sharing that we went through different exercises of what to do with the contents of all of, the, all of the buildings, whether we keep them on site, how that might work, or moving them off site, and how that might work. Of course, we sided with, let's go ahead and move them off site. Yes? What about uh, atrium? Are you going to have classes? Are they going to cancel for Right, no, they won't be, uh, we won't cancel children's formation. We'll find ways to do it creatively like we have in the past. So um, during Ian, we used the labyrinth um, as best we could, we used other rooms. So uh, we'll figure it out, and that's one of the reasons we have a children, youth, and young family director. So Julia uh, will be working on that. Stand up and wave, Julia. Uh, and then, of course, she works with the catechist too, like Meredith is, is there, Jessica's there. They'll work together as a team to pull off uh, something wonderful. And actually, I think, I was trying to remember, I think some of the kids really have fond memories about being out on the labyrinth for formation. I mean, I think it was, they felt like it was very special time. Um, so that's another, that's another piece, you know, when you think about what we do as a parish family, the strategic decisions to unify uh, the church campus, to have outdoor areas like the dock, the labyrinth, where we can offer um, different offerings has been uh, very worthwhile. Yes. Um, no, we go ahead. Um, the, some of the changes that are being made. So uh, we thought the flooring that was used post Ian would be great. Um, and that was based on seeing what it did in, it's a, like a vinyl flooring in the nursery. Um, this go round, it, it holds water too much underneath it and it can't breathe so it can't dry. So we'll put in some sort of ceramic tile. Um, again, the idea is not to have to go through as much of a hassle as we have before. Um, in thinking about whether to do things now or later, um, my feeling and thought is to make bigger changes that will be more durable over decades instead of years. We really want to be thoughtful about that. Uh, think through every sort of aspect, go through our experiences, and that does take some time to make a good uh, a decision. Um, decisions in times of emergency aren't always the best, and I'm experiencing that right now. You know, Ian, I was thinking, why didn't we put that concrete stuff in there? And, you know, we looked around and we said, because we, it wasn't just the church that was flooded that time, it was like everybody. Um, so, you know, we, we weren't all as thoughtful as we could have been in a calm, cool, collected way. Did I answer your question, kind of, sort of? Kind of, sort of? Yes. What about Thursday night? Yeah, those will, so Tuesday is when um, we'll sit down as a staff and look through the calendar. Um, and we'll go through every single thing and think about what will we do, what will we not do. We will have it in some form. I mean, it'll be here, um, table somewhere else, and then whatever. I mean, we'll have it, but we just need to figure out how to do that. I um, mean, that's where the staff sitting down in an air-conditioned room while they're not running around picking up things and moving things. Again, that's that we need decision-making time that is deliberate, and then we need this sort of emergency time that we're still in now until tomorrow and 
really uh, the staff gets to be back in their offices rather than worrying about moving contents. And you know, in part of this, um, I've had to call a widow and say, I can't do your funeral. <laughs> the church, that breaks my heart. Um, but she was great. She said, don't worry about a thing. We're going to do it. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, the Thanksgiving is appropriate for everybody. We'll do a prayer at the end, sort of. Hopefully, I uh, get that into the prayer. I mean, I tried to give that to you all in the sermon. You know, everybody helping together. It is a beautiful thing to witness. It really is. Any other questions? Seven more minutes. <laughs> Judy, you sure? Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, yes. Yay, Canadians. So it's Canadians Thanksgiving weekend. So we can give thanks for the great harvest for all the laborers out in the, in the fields who bring the bounty of the Lord and their hard, earned, and their hard work into, into our refrigerators and into our lives. Anything else? All right. Oh, thank you, Edward. Yes. You know, uh, well, thank you. It's not as easy as it looks. <laughs> uh, don't forget, um, if you all have anything on your hearts or minds, come in and chat. Um, you don't have to wait for Sundays to catch me uh, with a handshake at the door. Um, and that goes especially for those of you who have suffered in any way in this storm. Um, don't keep it bottled up. Bring it to family. Bring it to friends. Um, talk about it. Get it out. Um, as I said in the sermon, um, you know, the blessings that we are all here in an air-conditioned room with lights, with coffee, with AV and internet when people have died is huge. Um, and so just remembering that um, and delighting in the blessings of the Lord um, is something really important spiritually um, to do. Let's pray. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give thanks for the many hands in this parish family uh, who have worried and prayed, who have lifted and lugged, um, who have prepared, and who have responded to Hurricane Milton. Uh, we pray also for those who are not um, in um, our situation, for those who have a much worse day, uh, for those who have lost their lives. We give thanks for the first responders, for FPNL, um, and even for Comcast today. <laughs> um, but above all, we give thanks for your presence in our lives, for the blessings that you have given us and the opportunities for us to be called to be helpers in this world. These prayers we offer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Go get them, everybody. Oh, you're welcome. I'm glad to have you all back down. You know, some of us said we should all move to...